going to finish our series through the book of Amos, a book that uh, God has used uh, consistently to call his people to attention. Some of you will have heard this part a number of times, maybe this will be the fifth, and maybe you could say it alongside me, but before we jump in to today's text, I want to remind us of the setting of the book of Amos. Amos is written in about 750 BC, written 200 years after the kingdom of Israel has split into the kingdom of the north and the south, referenced as Israel and Judah. At this time in their history, they're in a unique moment where they're actually experiencing peace. They're not really fighting any major battles from the nations that surround them, and they're not currently fighting a civil war between their two kingdoms. And in that time of relative peace, they've been able to do some things that are unprecedented. They've been able to work their land and their cattle in ways with a pure focus without having to fight wars that they've been able to gain excess They're producing more than they need, and and for the first time, they've been able to take that excess and start to sell it to other countries and other places, and it's created rich people. For the first time in Israel's history, there's people who have a lot of stuff and didn't get it by being royalty. They've got it through their work ethic, their trades and their services, and their luxury. Luxuries become their definition of blessing. They've gotten to a point where in an effort to increase the amount of things that they have and to focus on the excess that is available to them, that many of those have started to oppress the poor. And so there's become a large wage gap between the rich and the poor. And particularly the rich started to buy and sell the poor as slaves, started to abuse the judicial system and the legal status to to really tax the poor a lot and to force the poor into hard working conditions for little wages so that the rich could gain excess things. In the midst of this time of luxury, in the midst of this time of peace, they've been able to solidify their fortresses and grow their military to a place of confidence where they don't think they can be attacked by other nations and have it be a problem, and they're confident they could attack anybody else and win a war. And so they find great comfort in their ability to defend themselves. Alongside this, they've continued their religious practice. Particularly, they've shown up into the temple on their Sabbath days and has sung their songs and given their offerings and, and tried to appease God with their religious behaviors. But the book will show us, Amos has been prophesying, that they've essentially been disobedient in both their personal and their social behaviors the other six days a week. That their religious worship was boiled down to worship services on one particular day and didn't extend to everything that they were supposed to be doing. As Amos opens the book, he tells the people of God of all the nations surrounding them and what they've done wrong and how judgment is coming to them. And then he turns his focus to remind them that God's people won't be uh, spared from this judgment. In fact, the nine chapters of Amos focused mostly on the northern kingdom, but on all of God's people and the judgment God wants to bring on them because they haven't held up their end of the covenant they're supposed to have with him. Chapters 3 and 4 then have God telling them the things they've done wrong as well as how he's tried to get their attention. I withheld rain from them, he withheld the harvest from them, he brought enemies against them, all in an effort to hope that they would return their focus onto who God is instead of remaining on themselves. And yet, those chapters would end with God saying, but you never returned to me. Chapter 5 then is God singing, or Amos singing, God's funeral song over them. God essentially saying, If you continue to behave this way, you might as well be dead to me. And reminds them at that point that if they want God's favor again in their life, that it won't come through their religious practice. It's not more offerings or more songs that they need to give. They need to return back to seeking God above all other things. Right relationship with God always more important than the right behaviors God hopes for. And so he says, seek me. Don't worry about what's going on in the temple. That's important, but seek me if you want to live. Last week, we covered the end of chapter 5 to the beginning of chapter 8, and we just recognized some of the things God says are hard to hear. 
He says that he's annoyed at the worship services of his people who aren't enacting justice and righteousness in the world once they leave the temple. And that he's frustrated to the point where he plans to destroy all of them. It ends then with Amos having four visions, a vision of locusts eating the entire harvest, a vision of fire destroying all of the land. And after both of those, Amos prays that God would relent, and he does. And then two more visions that are a little little more symbolic, one of the plumb line wall getting built, and then Israel being told that they would essentially groan, and then one of the baskets of fruit, and Israel essentially being told their time has come to an end, God will spare them no longer, the judgment is coming, the bodies will be flung everywhere, and wailing will be throughout the land. Today we'll pick up with God getting a little more specific again, of the examples of what his people have done to make him frustrated, of the judgment that's coming because of that. And then finally, at the end of the book, the last five verses, Amos will finally give some hope, a picture of restoration that comes from God. Amos chapter 8, starting in verse 4, says this, Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over, that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath be ended, that we may market wheat, skimping on the measure, boosting the price, and cheating with dishonest scales? God's again uh, honing in on those people who have gained excess, those people who have luxury and comfort, those people who have been able to produce a lot for themselves at the expense of the poor, trampling them and doing away with them. And he describes what their attitudes are like. It's like when you get to the new moon holiday, that's one of the Jewish festivals, or when you get to a Sabbath day, the day they're supposed to set aside and not do work, you're observing them. At least you're like made them part of your task list. Except the whole time that you're supposed to be worshiping, the whole time you're supposed to set this day aside as holy, all you're thinking to yourself is, can this religious stuff be done so I can go back to making money? Can this religious thing I'm supposed to do for God end? Can the holiday be done? Can the Sabbath get over so I can go back to marketing my wheat? I want to make more money. I want to accumulate more stuff. God's frustrated because his people who are supposed to be seeking him are annoyed by the days they're supposed to be sending with him. Like they're a task list that makes God happy if we accomplish it. God's reminding his people that's not the way it's supposed to be. Maybe that's a challenge for us as well. Do we show up to services like this? Assuming that if we sing songs, put something in the offering plate, listen to Nate ramble on for 30 minutes or something like that, that that means God's now happy and we can go back to doing whatever we want. That we somehow appeased the religious thing we're supposed to do and now we get to spend the rest of the time living life the way we would desire. That's what God's saying is people are doing and yet it's far from what the scriptures ever teach about what even the Sabbath is supposed to look like continually throughout the scriptures and maybe most emphasized by Jesus himself, he starts to remind us these kinds of days weren't created because God needs them. The Sabbath wasn't created for God. It was created for us so that we would have the right rhythm of life, so that we would recognize the identity we have comes most sincerely from the day we don't produce anything, the day we set aside as holy, the day that we're focused on our relationship with God, that who we are, as it matters most, is who God says we are and in relationship to Him. That the other six days, that the days we produce are the less holy days, The Sabbath is there to remind us that our identity doesn't come from our bank accounts, doesn't come from our work, doesn't come from what we do to gain the esteem or the praise of others. It comes from our relationship with God. And yet many of us have distorted that. We find ourselves saying, God, I'm showing up to the religious things. I'm doing the task you put before me because you demand it. And yet all we're thinking about is that project we need to do at work. What's going to happen when Monday comes? How we prepare to make more money again, to market our wheat in their language. 
We find our identity maybe more often in the things we're producing than in the God that we're in love with. God's reminding His people, if you've turned your relationship within me to a list of behaviors, and it's not about seeking me and loving me and pursuing me and spending time with me, then the religious behaviors are frustrating to me. He goes on then, though, to call essentially his people hypocrites when he gives the way that they sell their wheat and trample on the poor. You skimp on the measure, you boost the price, and you cheat with dishonest scales. You would take the measurement standard uh, for the size of what the bargain was supposed to be, and they would get a slightly smaller version of it. So they're selling just a little bit less of what they're saying to each customer than what they advertise. Or on the second one, they would take the weight that you put for the common price on the scale and they would increase their standard one. Their shekel would now weigh a little bit more. So when they put it on the scale, what they needed from people in return costs just a little bit more. Or maybe they would go one step further and just take their scale and make it completely dishonest. Always putting their stuff on one side and the other people's stuff on the other side so that it would be an imbalance, that they were always getting the better end of the deal. He's saying this about people who who are hypocrites because they're keeping the religious day set aside as if God's doing well, as if they're trying to make him happy. And yet all of the business they partake in is cheating other people. In an effort to gain more for themselves, they're cheating other people. It goes on to say that they're even buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals selling even the sweepings with the wheat. They've created the system, even within their own people enough, that they've started to abuse the poor, not just in their dishonest scales, but they've started to buy and sell them as a commodity. And that they've created a desperation within them. That as they're a group of people who can't grow the food themselves, who can't buy the things they need easily, God says that you've gotten to the place where you recognize they don't even need just pure wheat anymore. They don't need the high quality product anymore. They don't need name brand. You can put the sweepings in alongside the wheat and they'll still pay for it out of their desperation. And the people have started to take advantage of that. People have become commodities. We've created desperation within them that we make them and force them to settle for less because they don't have money. I don't know if you're like me, but there have been moments in my life where I've recognized that pattern of behavior and judgment in my own life. It was made most clear to me when reading a book by Donald Miller called Blue Like Jazz years ago. He told a story in the middle of it of a day that he was in a grocery store And the person in front of him was paying with food stamps. And how he looked as they pulled out their food stamps, he immediately started to judge everything else they had placed on the conveyor belt. As if being poor and being rich meant somebody was allowed to be in a place of judgment. That if somebody who had less, we suddenly got to say, well, they shouldn't buy name brand or snack foods or luxury foods. They should only be allowed the bare necessities. Of life, But because I have more and because I'm paying with my money that I've earned, I'm in a position to judge them. And I've recognized through a story he told that there's moments on my life where not only is my identity found in the things that I have instead of the relationship I have with God, that I start to judge other people based on the things that they have or don't have instead of their relationship with God and what he says about them. Who are those with much to start saying, well, they're desperate enough, they should have to live on less than what I get. Their lack of money means they should deal with a different level of humanity than I deal with when it comes to things like food and shelter. And maybe you're at moments of life like me, and if you're honest, you recognize that you hold judgment over people based on their accumulation 
or their financial status. Instead of on their character, or on their heart with God, or on their relationship, on the life He says they have, on the worth He says they have. God is frustrated with His people as they cheat others, as they're hypocritical with their own worship services, and as they trample the poor. He continues saying, The Lord sworn Himself the pride of Jacob. I will never forget anything they have done. Will not the land tremble for this and all who live in it mourn? The whole land will rise like the Nile. It will be stirred up and then sink like the river of Egypt. This is poetic imagery where God's saying, I won't forget these behaviors. I've seen them. I've watched them. I've noted them. I will judge them. And the imagery here is that of an earthquake. The land will tremble. The people will mourn. The land will be like it's rising and dropping like the Nile. It will be crashing against itself with ebbs and flows and trembles that are the poetic imagery of an earthquake. I'll not forget what my chosen people have done. And I will bring an earthquake and they'll all mourn because of it. In that day, declares the Sovereign Lord, I'll make the sun go down at moon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I'll turn your religious festivals into mourning and all your singing into weeping. I will make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. I'll make that time like mourning as for an only sun and the end of it like a bitter day. As my people continue to oppress the poor, continue to define themselves by luxury, continue to be hypocrites, continue to think religious behavior is what matters instead of relationship, as they get to that place, their religious behaviors will turn to mourning. Their singing will turn to weeping. It will be so dark that all of them will be in sackcloth and shave their heads. Those are the symbols of grief in the ancient Near East. Sackcloth would be a garment, highly uncomfortable, very hairy, made to remind yourself you're not in a place of luxury, but in a place of discomfort. And then shaving the head was a symbol of joining somebody in mourning. Maybe no different than we see people do as they have a friend who's going through cancer treatments. And losing their hair and others shave their head alongside as a sign of that symbolism of coming alongside and mourning with them. God says, everyone will be mourning. You'll all be in your uncomfortable clothes. You'll all be grieving. You'll all be wailing and grieving like you just lost your only son. That's the picture he has for his people because they aren't holding up their end of the covenant relationship. But it continues. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, but not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. God tells his people, I'm going to remove my presence from you. You won't hear me speak through the prophets. You won't hear my words through the priests and the written word. And you will be desperate for it. You may think hearing the curses is hard. You may think hearing my voice is hard when it sounds negative and abrasive, but it will be nothing like if I remove my voice completely. You'll be staggering around from sea to sea, from north to east, begging and looking and searching for me to speak to you, to hear my word, but you won't find it. I'm again going to pause before we get back into those verses. In the ancient Near East, the scriptures will record the word of God was considered a luxury. Uh, a luxury that they got continually, but it was considered like honey on your lips. That's the imagery the Psalms often use. That it was the sweetest thing. That it was what you would pursue and love. God's saying, I'm going to remove it from you. You're going to stagger around looking for it and you won't find it. When I think about our time, our day and age, our society, I wonder not just if we would notice if God removed his word, but if we've forgotten to treat it like a luxury at all. 
If we consider this book and God speaking to us uniquely like honey on our lips, or if we consider it a resource that sits on a shelf that we run to in times of desperation and need. God's saying, when I'm most frustrated with my people because of their behavior, I may stop speaking to them. I'll give them the silent treatment and they should notice it and they should long for it. And it would be worse than being without food. It's maybe more substantial than the darkness and the morning. And yet I'm challenged by wondering, would we notice? Would we seek? Would we stagger? Would we wander? Would we search? God says, if we are searching for him, searching for his voice, and we're not finding it, and we're not hearing it, it may be because he's frustrated with us, because we treated him like a task list, and not like a relationship we're in covenant with. I plead with you, seek God in his word. <laughs> Treat it like honey on your lips and he will speak to you. You'll find him. And if you don't, evaluate if you're in right relationship with him. We'll talk a little bit later about when God restores. And that it's not based on our behaviors. It's not about being right religiously. It's about being right relationally. And he longs to restore. Before that though, he still says, in that day, the lovely young women and the strong young men will faint because of thirst. Those who swear by the sin of Samaria, who say, as surely as your God lives, Dan, or as surely as the God of Beersheba lives, they will fall never to rise again. I'm going to judge my people and they're going to die. Amos is then given another vision, maybe the fifth added to the four that are in chapter seven, where he sees the Lord standing by an altar and God says, strike the top of the pillars so that the thresholds shake, bring them down on the heads of all the people. Those who are left, I will kill with the sword. No one will get away. None will escape Though they dig down to the depths below, from there my hand will take them. Though they climb up to the heavens above, from there I will bring them down. Though they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, there I will hunt them down and seize them. Though they hide from my eyes at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent to bite them. Though they are driven into exile by their enemies, there I will command the sword to slay them. The vision Amos gives is of God saying, to his people who are worshiping in a temple. Strike down the pillars from the top so that it crushes all the way down to the thresholds and they shake and tremble. Destroy the temples from top to bottom and kill everybody that's in them. And anybody who flees or escapes or who wasn't in the temple will die by the sword. The imagery of that in the Old Testament isn't of God coming and wielding a sword himself. That's always imagery to assume that a foreign nation will be raised up and would defeat the Israelites in war. That they would die in battle at the hands of an enemy. Those who are left will be killed by the sword. None will get away. None will escape. And then it gives some statements of what those who respond are going to try to do. The first two are kind of outlandish. If they try to dig down deeps to the depth of hell, Sheol, dig down to get away from me, I'll go find them there. They can't get away there. If they try to climb up onto the heavens to join me, I'll find them there and they'll still get their consequence. If they run to the top of Mount Carmel, an area there that would have been a forested mountaintop, a place people could have easily gone and hot, hidden nearing the Medi near the Mediterranean Sea. If they go to, to the natural place to try to hide, I'll find them there too. If they go to the depths of the sea, I'll send the serpents to bite them. 
wherever the people go, even if they're driven into exile and into a foreign land and think they found safety there, I'll rise that enemy up to chase them down and kill them there. The people are going to try to escape my judgment and that will be fruitless. They will be found. They will be slain. And there's maybe one of the darkest statements in all of Scripture that follows. I will keep my eye on them, God says, for harm and not for good. This is God speaking to his chosen people. I'll keep my eye on them, not to come and rescue them at the last moment, not to come alongside them and extend the mercy that I've, they've known me for. Not should, to show up and redeem. My eye is on them for their harm. I am that frustrated with my people who made religious behavior a task list and who ignored all of what the covenant relationship is supposed to look like. Who prioritized their identity in their things, in their accumulation, in their wealth who have trampled the poor, who have had lacks of justice and lacks of righteousness, those people I will keep my eye on, but it will be for harm and not for good. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, He touches the earth and He melts all who live in it mourn. The whole land rises like the Nile and then sinks like the river of Egypt. He builds his lofty place in the heavens and sets its foundations on the earth. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land. The Lord is his name. And he's frustrated. From his palace on heaven, the foundations on the earth, he can make it tremble, he can flood it. He is frustrated with his people. Are you not Israelites the same to me as the Cushites, declares the Lord? Did I not bring Israel up from Egypt, the Philistines from Kaphtor, and the Arameans from Ker? Surely the eyes of the sovereign Lord are on the sinful kingdom. I will destroy it from the face of the earth, yet I will not totally destroy the descendants of Jacob, declares the Lord. For I will give the command and will shake the people of Israel among the nations as grain is shaken in a sieve, and not a pebble will reach the ground. All the sinners among my people will die by the sword. All those who say disaster will not overtake or meet us. God says, I protected you from those other sinful nations. We fought the war against the Philistines. We fought the war against the Arameans. Those who you knew were the sinful kingdoms and I defeated you. Don't you realize you're no different from them? I was always just defeating the sinful kingdoms. And now you're the sinful kingdom. Now you're the one my eye is on. My eyes, the eyes of the sovereign Lord, are on the sinful kingdom. And that's his chosen people. And in their sin, they will die. The first glimmer of hope he gives, though, is that not all of the people will die. That he will lift up his nation and sort them like grain in a sieve. That he will put them there and as the grain falls through, the pebbles will remain and be held within. And as that separation happens, those who have made their religious behaviors a task list instead of a relationship, those who have abused the poor, avoided justice and righteousness, those who have decided their identity is based on their luxury instead of their relationship with God, those who have been sinning and thinking they're doing okay, will all die. Even though they think disaster wouldn't come, they will find themselves in the midst of disaster. And yet, those who have been faithful in relationship and covenant to God, those who have sought Him, not those who are perfect, because none of them are, none of us are, but those who have sought their identity in God and in right relationship with Him, He will spare in that day, it says, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I'll repair its broken walls and restore its ruins and will rebuild it as it used to be so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. There's a day coming when I will restore what David had built. The fortresses he used to defeat the foreign kingdoms will stand again. And my people 
when they see restoration, maybe the first way that they will see it is in power over their enemies, like David had. He continues, And the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. And he gives a picture of a harvest so bountiful that while you're still picking the grapes from the vine, you'll have expanded the whole season still with more grapes to harvest to the time where it's ready to be planted again. You haven't even harvested everything you grew the last time. That when God restores his people, they'll have power over their enemies and they'll have agricultural bounty and luxury again. The hope being, though, this time, that they'll use it not to oppress, not to create identity, but they'll use it the way God has always instructed us to, as he blesses his people, that we would then bless the world. That's been his plan from the start. And I'll bring my people Israel back from exile. They'll rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They'll plant the vineyards and drink their wine. They will make their gardens and eat their fruits. When restoration comes to God's people, it will come with power over the enemies. It will come with bounty of agriculture and luxury. And it will come with the return and repossession of the land. And then it comes with a promise. And I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. No different than when he promised after the flood never to flood his people again. He says, after I've had to deal with my chosen people in this way, after I've had to (coughs) sift them and separate them and destroy some of them, when I restore them, they'll never have to go through that kind of suffering again. And since then, scholars have wondered and argued and historians have debated, has that restoration happened? After the temple was destroyed and the people were exiled from ba- because of Babylon and then came back with Ezra and Nehemiah and they rebuilt the temple and they rebuilt the walls, is that the restoration? God's people are back. Did they have, did they have power over the enemies? Did they have the agriculture abounding? Did they return and repossess all of their land? And by and large, what all historians and what most scholars would agree on is no. Israel has never been at the place where they've then returned to having power over their enemies, agricultural bounty, return and repossession of their land, to then have the promise hold true that they won't be uprooted again, that it hasn't happened. And the likely best thing for us to do is then reinterpret it with the new covenant. Not as Israel proper, but with Jesus and God's chosen people. Those in right relationship with God. Who someday will have power over their enemies, agricultural bounty, and return and repossession of all that God has promised us. And that likely won't be fulfilled until Christ returns and reigns with us. For us never to suffer again, never to be uprooted again, to stay in right relationship with God without him judging us any longer in this way. And the book ends. A simple book. Subtitled, The Whole Time We've Been Studying It, God Calls His People to Attention. That's us. For nine chapters, what God has said as it opened, what the lion has roared and what the thunder has rubbled, is that God will judge his people. That starting a relationship with him does not get you out of judgment. We will be judged for our behaviors. Hopefully, in right relationship and because of Christ, we'll be judged by his righteousness instead of our own. Because ours falls short. And God will send curses and hard times to his people. And they become, those come because of those people's actions. In Amos, primarily the actions of greed, the abuse of poor, because of seeking comfort more than God, because of religious hypocrisy, because of injustice, because of lack of righteousness. And yet God still longs to restore. But that restoration doesn't come because of our actions. It, becomes, it comes because of the grace and mercy of our God the imploring in the book of Amos and throughout all of Scripture 
is simply to seek him. Seek him and he'll restore. Seek him and he'll be merciful. Seek him and he'll send relief. Seek him and he'll bless us. Hopefully so that we'll then bless others. That we should seek God above all things, not rely on religious practice to earn God's favor. That never works. It's right relationship with God in, through Christ that God sends his love. That he blesses and then asks us to bless others. So here's the hope. The hope is that we would be people, that if God was sifting us now, we would be the ones found to not be prioritizing ourselves, our bank accounts, and hoping that our religious behavior is enough, but we would be the ones he would sift and find in right relationship with him, aiming to hold up our end of the covenant relationship we've entered. And if we haven't, or if it seems like God is silent, that we would seek him, that we wouldn't try to earn it by showing up to more religious things. That doesn't work. That we would appropriately seek him and worship him and love him and listen to him and obey him. And as we do so, he consistently shows he'll extend grace and mercy. He's longing us for us to return. But he's calling us to attention. If you think your bank account, your comfort in militaries or fortresses, your luxury can save you. If you think showing up and singing some songs, putting something in an offering plate, or listening to a message on God's word is enough to make God happy, then you aren't doing relationship with him well. Seek God daily. Enact his covenant, his righteousness, his justice in every moment. Find your identity in what he says is true about you instead of what you think you earn by producing. And allow God to bless. And then use that blessing to shed, share to the rest of the world who desperately need to come in right relationship with him as well. Would you pray with me that that would be true of us? God, I pray that you would say anything hard to us individually you need to. That you would let us know where our behavior has swayed out of the covenant relationship we have with you and into doing life on our own apart from you. That you would continue to send signs in our life calling us to return from you like you did to your people in the ancient Near East and that we would hear them and return. That we would seek you and live, we would find your word and your voice a luxury, that we would long for that. And we would try to then live our lives in response to that as best as possible. And we'd long for you to restore, for us to have power over enemies, both physical and spiritual, for us to have bounty and luxury, blessings that you provide, that we then extend to others as well. And for us to return and possess everything you've promised us. We know that we need your spirit at work within us for that to be true. We know that we need Jesus' presence and grace extended to us for that to be true. And so we pray in his name that it would be true. And that we'd obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.